Um, so thank you for, um, for, for inviting me. First of all, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Michael Rowe. Until recently, I was the head of the physiotherapy department at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town. Um, I moved to the UK about a year ago and I'm now associate professor for digital innovation um, in the School of Health and Social Care at the University of Lincoln. Also recently taken on the role of chair of our working group at the university for artificial intelligence in learning. Um, and I think that's really been the focus of my, my interest in this topic is on how we support student learning. Um, today, the title of my talk is Universal Anything Machines. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm getting notifications and I'm, I'm just be aware that I'm looking at my slides, not, not the chat. So um, uh, if I'm getting notifications for my attention that I won't be able to see them. Um, so I'm, I'm talking today about what, what I think of as universal anything machines, and I'm going to try and avoid taking a position on whether these language models are good or bad. Um, I know in the, in the introduction, you were talking about this fight or flight response, and I think that's our natural tendency to, um, to figure out if this is something that we need to be afraid of or, or if we need to um, you know, run away from it um, or fight it. And I think in, in both of those situations, it's about threat. Um, and I think that's interesting um, because the two narratives that we face um, uh, at the moment around generative AI uh, really falls into these two categories. That generative AI is either bad for higher education because there's the potential for cheating and the risk to assessment validity. I'd suggest that um, we, we've always had a potential for cheating and that our most of our assessments in higher education are neither valid nor reliable. So I, I would say that we, we don't, not much has changed with the arrival of uh, generative AI. The other narrative is that generative AI is good, for, uh, excuse me, good for higher education. And the driving mo motivation here is that we're, we're looking at assessment reform, we're looking at improvements in efficiency, and there's this kind of adapt or die um, uh, paradigm. So the framework that universities tend to use uh, when talking about generative AI is that there's institutional risk if you don't defend against generative AI, and there's risk if you don't embrace it. And I've seen very little discussion so far on the potential of uh, generative AI to support learning. Um, and what I'm trying to encourage at my own institution is this idea of collective sense making. So rather than seeing this as a threat that we need to um, adapt, adapt to um, or defend against, I'd like to see our role as taking, um, taking a position where this is something that is fundamentally changing society. Um, and how do we make sense of that? How do we make meaning of that um, in terms of our own position as universities in the higher education sector? Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on talking about what exactly um, ChatGPT and large language models are. Um, I think that most people have an understanding of what they do, which I think for the purposes of this presentation will be enough. I'm going to touch on some concepts that are relevant in the, um, in the discourse around large language models, just to try and create an argument about where I see these trends in technology development taking us towards. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the technical details, but I will touch on some aspects of, of those technical details. So large language models um, basically are a combination of natural language programming, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, and deep learning techniques, which is another subset of artificial intelligence. The combination of these two um, uh, forms of AI um, allows us to build algorithms that can generate and understand human text. And I put understand in uh, you know, scare, scare quotes, because I recognize that um, AI doesn't understand text in the same way that human beings understand text, but I want us to focus on competence, not consciousness. So if we're just thinking of um, understanding in the context of competence, I think it's fair to say that artificial intelligence understands human text, because we can interact with it through natural language. Um, the way that we interact with these models is through a user interface. And at the moment, these are typically web-based chatbots. So in the case of the GPT language model, um, OpenAI has made access to that model available through um, a chatbot called ChatGPT. In the case of Google's um, Palm language models, we access that through BARD. And 
I think it's important to recognize that it's not always going to be like this. Um, it's not going to be long before these language models are um, a user interface in their own right, which means that uh, just like you talk to Siri, you talk to your TV, you can talk to your phone. I think that we'll interact with language models through through natural language and um, through voice, through audio. Um, we won't be sitting there typing uh, prompts into a chatbot. We're also going to see increased use of API access. Uh, what this means is that third party developers are going to be able to access large language models um, with applications that they develop on their own. And we're all already seeing people um, coming up with uh, services, um, software applications that are able to plug into these large language models and make use of them, um, even though they don't uh, build the language model into the software itself. Um, I've mentioned that the interaction is in the form of a prompt. Again, I don't really think that this is something that's going to um, uh, be necessary in the future. We're already seeing examples from Google and Microsoft where the, um, the interface to the language model sits in a sidebar in Word or Outlook, Google Docs, and it observes your behavior as a user, and it is going to prompt you um, to respond. So as you're working on that research paper, um, as you're working on setting up a test, um, these language models are going to sit alongside what you're doing, be, um, be cognizant of what you're doing, and they are going to prompt you with questions and instructions. Um, the way that the model works is that it predicts the next word in a sentence. And at the moment, that's all that language models do. They're next word predictors. Um, and they do this according to a probability distribution that was created during the training phase. So basically, when you ask ChatGPT a question, um, it, uh, it doesn't, uh, oh, sorry, I've got confused now. When you ask ChatGPT a question, it doesn't refer to a database and pull out an answer. It looks at the contextual um, relevance of words in the prompt that you use, and then it starts generating text based on the, the probability distribution of the average of all human conversation that has been used in the training phase. Um, the contextual richness of the prompt is a really important indicator of the quality of the generated response. And the more context there is in the prompt, um, the higher quality the output is. This context is understood through something called tokens. And the token is a form of text compression that allows the model to transform our complex natural language into simpler concepts. And I think for the purposes of this uh, presentation, it's not necessarily important to understand the details of how that happens, um, only that we're seeing language models that are able to take more and more tokens um, as part of the prompt, which allows them to generate more contextually aware um, and rich responses. Um, and this allows the, the response from the language model to be more focused and relevant. Um, the contextual awareness of language models is constantly increasing, and I think they're capable of taking in the um, same amount of text, uh, some of the more advanced models um, at the cutting edge of this, of this research domain, is that they can take in as much text as there is content in the entire series of the Harry Potter books. Um, so you can imagine taking every Harry Potter book, um, inputting that as the contextual prompt, and then having a conversation with the language model based on that input. And if you think of the, the amount of detail in those um, Harry Potter books, you can imagine it creating an entire world um, and then having a conversation with it about the details of that world. Um, I mentioned that the responses that uh, ChatGPT gives are not retrieved from a database. Um, so they're generated one word at a time using the prompt as the starting point. This means that there's no ground truth for language models. It has no model of the world that it's referring to. So for example, when we talk about it's hallucinating, um, uh, it's not really hallucinating in the sense that we understand it. It's not like it differ it, it, it's different from reality, which is what we think hall hallucinations are. Um, they're fabrications. Um, for ChatGPT, every single response that it creates is a fabrication. It's just that increasingly, those fabrications map more and more accurately onto our own model of the world. Um, and I think that this is especially important when we think about things like data provenance. Data provenance is the idea that we can basically audit the data that's used to come up with a description. Um, when it comes to these long, large language models, um, not even the developers of the language model understand where the, how the data is being used to generate the response. And 
This is especially important when we see people talking about citing ChatGPT. It doesn't make sense conceptually to cite ChatGPT because it isn't a source. Um, it's taking as its, um, I guess, model of the world, the average of all human discussion about that uh, topic. Um, ChatGPT isn't able to point backwards to a canonical source for its responses. Um, and every time you ask ChatGPT to generate a response to a prompt, it generates something new. Um, and so I think we need to be very careful when we talk about citing language models as some kind of ground truth themselves. Um, it's important to understand that everything that they do is literally being made up one word at a time. It's almost um, lucky that they, that what they generate maps onto our understanding of reality. Um, and that last point I think is important. Um, so even though we're not able to explain exactly how this works, um, these language models are proving uh, remarkably good at um, limited forms of world building, even if only one token at a time. So we can interrogate these language models. We can interact with them. We can have conversations and ongoing discussions with them. Um, and I think that's quite profound when you realize that they are literally um, coming up with uh, one word at a time. Um, at the moment, these are what I think of as the generic features of large language models. They're currently being built into all software ecosystems from Microsoft to Facebook to Apple to Google. Um, we're going to see these being built into mobile phone operating systems. So this is going to become a natural part of the fabric of our society. It's not something that you're going to need a computer for um, very soon. Uh, it's not something that you're going to be typing um, questions into, and it's definitely not something that we're going to be able to control and ban in higher education. We're already seeing the emergence of offline access through smaller models that sit on um, very low powered devices like smartphones. Um, so you're going to be carrying around some version of these in your pockets um, uh, all day, every day. We're seeing an explosion of diversity of models from boutique models to open source models. Um, so ChatGPT and the GPT language model that, that underlies ChatGPT are definitely not going to be the, the only players in this game. And so institutions that are building their responses to large language models around ChatGPT, which is a single product from a single company, um, are going to very quickly find it difficult to adapt and respond to the massive diversity of models that we're seeing proliferating. Um, we're starting to see the emergence of networks of language models where the outputs of one model becomes an input for another. And this is where we start seeing a multimodality uh, where you can input an image and it generates a, a textual response. And that textual response can then be used as an input into another model, which you can query in different ways. Um, so these things are starting to work together. At the moment, it's all under human agency. And so we're making decisions about which outputs and which models um, get combined uh, to create these kind of more complex networks. I was going to say organisms, but that probably doesn't um, create the right uh, metaphor. Um, and we're seeing greater contextual awareness, um, which means we're going to see greater richness and complexity in the interactions. So you can imagine these networks of models that are all interacting with each other and we become one node in that network. Um, it's going to get very interesting very quickly. Uh, some recent feature updates in language models that I think are especially important to note. Um, I mentioned multimodality, which is where language models can translate between media formats. So you can give it an image and it can generate a textual response um, based on that image. So you can ask questions of the image and it can talk back to you and tell you about the image. And then it works the same in, in the other direction as well. And we're seeing interesting things starting to emerge now with video um, as a format. Um, we're starting to see fine tuning of language models. So um, uh, Google's uh, Pathways language model um, has been trained or finely tuned on um, medical data sets. And so, you know, concerns that large language models are not really um, uh, exceptional when it comes to the kinds of responses that they generate, I think those concerns are going to go away very quickly. One of the concerns that we've been looking at in um, health and social care is that the responses that language models generate are quite generic. And so initially they seem really impressive, but over time, the more that you work with them, the more it seems that they're not really capable of digging in deeply um, to some of these topics. 
That's all going to change with these very narrowly focused models that are trained on very specific data sets like law, medicine, engineering. Um, embeddings, I think, is going to be profoundly important for learning. This is where we see personalized models that are customized with private data. So if you have a, um, a version of uh, these language models that are running on your own computer, um, open access language models are going to make this possible. Um, they're actually already possible, but it's quite technical to set them up. At some point, uh, companies are going to um, emerge that will make these things very simple, very trivial to install. You'll have an open source language model running on your computer. You'll be able to give it private access to your emails, your notes, your presentations, articles. And this will then be able to generate customized responses based on its understanding of your personal life. You can imagine giving it access to your calendar, your contact lists, um, and the, the way that you interact with those kinds of models are going to be, um, I think, profoundly important, provided you have a, a big enough corpus of data that you can provide it for, for training. Uh, OpenAI recently released about 80 plugins that give the, um, the GPT language models additional skills that we can make use of through natural language. I thought the most important of these was probably uh, internet access and computation. So you have plugins now where ChatGPT can access the internet, um, so it can access more relevant, up-to-date information. Um, the Wolfram Alpha um, plugin gives ChatGPT uh, crazy level uh, computation skills. So all the concerns around ChatGPT not being very good at maths, those go away. Um, you can imagine plugins for citation, um, for fact-checking, uh, um, the knowledge claims made by language models. All of those concerns will, will just become a thing of the past um, as we see more and more of these skills being um, augmented to the language model through plugins. And then the last thing that I thought was, was really important was what OpenAI calls system message. This is where software developers can create personas um, that you can interact with the model um, through. And we're already seeing examples that people are building around personal tutors, coaches, study guides, assessors. Um, so rather than the language model being this generic language model, you can actually say to it, I want you to be a tutor. I want you to tutor me as if I were a first year physics student. You should assume that I know nothing about this topic and I'd like to engage with you through a question and answer process. So when you provide chat GPT with that kind of prompt, it then can take on a persona and it will interact with you as that persona or, or character. Um, and I think that the combination of everything that I'm talking about um, enables the creation of highly customizable, contextually rich, personally aware characters that are high level experts in a wide range of disciplines, and we can interact with them through natural language. And if you read that sentence again, you'll see that I've just described a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, an engineer. Um, we're going to see networks of generative AI systems that interact with each other. Um, they're going to be increasingly autonomous and they're going to be embedded across society. Um, and so how does society change when every person in the world has access to a personal physician, teacher, lawyer, accountant, um, basically when we have expertise on demand? And, and I think at the moment we're at a precipice, we're at a, a unique moment in time. Um, up until this point in the history of our species, expertise has been expensive and time consuming to develop. This typically means that expertise is scarce. Um, and I think we're going to get to a point very soon where expertise is going to be um, abundant and ubiquitous. And I think we need to ask as higher education institutions, what is our role in a world where everyone has universal access to high level expertise across all the knowledge domains? It used to be that universities would be the place where we would, we would cultivate expertise, we would aggregate expertise, and then we would distribute it through the world by the graduation of students. But is that going to be our role when everyone in the world has access to a physiotherapist, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer? So I think that as a sector, we have um, a lot to think about. Uh, we need to understand this technology. We need to understand what it means for us. And we need to put ourselves in a position where we can help to make sense of what this means for society. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we still have 10 minutes left for this session. So I just want to check in to see if we have any online comments or questions, and then we'll come to the audience here.
nothing online at the moment. Let's just see from the audience here in Pochester. If there's anybody who would like to make a comment or ask Michael something. Um, can you please take the microphone to Nadine in the front row? Um, thanks, Michael. Um, I was thinking while you were talking about how um, us being connected or plugged in, um, uh, it will be plugged into our calendars, our lives and whatnot, and it will shape our prompts and the prompts it will give us about what we give it. But if it is so, um, how can I say, um, calculated um, according to our daily lives, um, what... Um, in Afrikaans, sorry, it's Monday. <laughs> um, um, uh, what opportunity would there be there for surprise um, encounters with something outside your frame of reference? For instance, if you just, um, if all your prompts are going to be um, uh, dependent on the things you're already exposed to, um, how would you get access to new worldviews um, and change the way of thinking, sort of perpetuating? If I think about the whole decolonial mindset, um, how would we colonize our minds if we are only exposed to one way? Oh, thanks. I, I think that's a, a really important question and it touches on this idea of serendipity. Um, so at the moment, it's difficult to control all information streams that come into you, into your consciousness. Um, so you're always going to be exposed to new ideas. Um, no matter how hard you try to insulate yourself against those new ideas. So we're seeing this um, at the moment in social media where people exist in these uh, bul uh, bubbles that filter out um, all views that uh, aren't aligned with your own. Um, and we know the detrimental effect that this has on social discourse. Um, if you're unable to have empathy for, for the views of what you perceive as the other. Um, I think that this is only going to be exacerbated even more because you're going to be able to control exactly what kind of an AI uh, you're going to have as a personal assistant. So <clears throat> you can specifically say that you want a conservative, uh, right-wing, um, uh, you know, fanatic um, as your as your AI assistant. Um, this, I think, is a difference in kind. Um, I mean, a difference in um, uh, what's what's the phrase? Um, it's it's not different in principle to what we already do but it's going to make it far more efficient. Um, so I think potentially this could lead to uh, more bubbles um, that are more insulated um, and, and more problematic for society. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how, how we deal with that. It, it could be that the kinds of language models that people create have some kind of randomness that's built into it. So that um, you know when you are looking at a certain social media feeds, um, it prompts you to say, look, <clears throat> you've only been looking at one side of the story. Would you like to be exposed to other sides? I mean, we do this all the time. We, we have confirmation bias built into our, our own software systems that we're almost entirely unaware of. Uh, Daniel Kahneman's work has shown that even someone like him who spends all of his time thinking about heuristics and biases is not immune to confirmation bias, availability bias. So we have... The bugs that are built into our own um, consciousness that we're not even aware of. I can imagine that I would like an AI assistant that tells me when I'm only paying attention to certain kinds of media. Um, be a way to try and avoid the kinds of biases that, that human beings are especially susceptible to. So I think if you have an, uh, an open-minded personality, you're probably going to have an AI assistant that's going to help you expand that open-mindedness. If you're more conservative and close-minded, your AI assistant is going to drive you further down that road. Um, I, I don't see that the, this is being, in principle, any different to what we already have today. It's just going to be far more effective and efficient um, at doing that. I don't know if that's answered your question. That's kind of the way that I think about it at the moment. Uh, Michael, thank you. I, my question links with the previous one. Um, if the, um, these chatbots become the experts in society, um, comparable with experts at universities at the moment, my question is, um, 
if you're an expert at the university, other experts check you. If you if you're really knowledgeable, if you have an informed uh, answer, uh, etc. You know, if you if it's a fair and good answer. But it seems to me, I always can present themselves as experts, and then to a, a much broader uh, audience, uh, who check this expert then um, <laughs> if it presents itself as an expert. Thanks. Um, well, I think that that's also a really good question. I, I've been thinking about this in the context of peer review. Um, so at the moment, we might say that our expertise is checked through the process of peer review um, in, a, in a variety of different formats. So that might be formal peer review when we submit articles to journals, when we present at conferences, uh, when we present at you know, seminars like this one. <clears throat> I don't see any reason why we won't be able to do the same thing with the responses generated by AI. So even now you can tell uh, ChatGPT whether its response is good or bad. So you can give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, that customization and fine tuning of language models is happening all the time by human experts. Uh, so every time we fine tune a language model, there's a process in the background where human doctors, human experts are going through the responses that are being generated by the, um, the AI saying this response is better than that response and giving a reason. Um, but I think at some point it's going to it's going to get to the point where even human experts um, are going to be hard pressed to be able to tell the difference between a good response and a bad response. Um, we're already seeing that at, at the moment where we have generated responses from language models and it takes me i've spent 15 years looking at technology in higher education it takes me a long time to understand whether or not the response is a good one or a bad one um, if we're at that point then does it really matter um, because we don't fact check every single thing that our colleagues say um, i've 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 said things in this presentation and i, I haven't included citations um, you know, how many of you have the expertise and the background to fact check every single thing that I've said? Um, and yet most people in the room are probably just taking on um, uh, um, authority, I guess, that, that what I'm saying is true. Um, and I think most of our lives are lived this way. We don't fact check every single thing that, that people tell us. Um, language models are incredibly plausible and it's already taking experts a very long time to pick apart some of the responses that are being generated. Um, I don't know the way around this other than to maybe suggest that when models tell us things that fail in the world, um, there will be a feedback mechanism that we can use to try and improve their responses the next time. Um, but I, I think that's a, a, a really good question and I, I'm not really sure exactly how we deal with that other than for human beings to provide the um, the feedback mechanism to improve uh, language models in the same way we provide each other with peer review and feedback that we use to improve each other. Sorry, that was a long rambling response. Um, I hope I at least touched on the, qu the, the question that you asked. 